All right, let's turn in your Bibles. Okay. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and hopefully you have a Kleenex or something, a little bookmark or a string, in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 18. Again, just for quite a bit this year, we're going to be doing some bouncing back and forth as we see the different nations and kings. All right, now... Uh, God, when he had men write the scriptures, it's always interesting, not everything in the Bible is chronological, what happened in Genesis and then Exodus. We know there's different things in there. Job is not necessarily in order. And neither are all of the activities and the writings here in uh, First and Second Samuel. Um, some things are, are uh, right in line, some things he back, goes back in time. And that's especially too, true during the time of the kings. That's why we have to sometimes look in, uh, back and forth, but... Hopefully, uh, well, you haven't, probably most of you haven't started your worksheets for lessons 16, 17, 18. Um, but as you do them, these names that we mentioned today will be familiar to you. You'll recognize them. Okay? All right, 2 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, we're going to look at some, uh, this is lesson 16, David's victories. Okay? Uh, starting at verse 1. And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them, and David took. Mephagama out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, even with two lines measured. He put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. Okay. I'd ask in your notes to look back at Genesis 15, verse 18. God there had given a promise to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. And many times throughout history we read that, but that was when he first gave it. This land would be the land of the covenant promise. Not only that, this land would be, we know, a picture of heaven. That crossing over the Jordan River is a picture of a passage from life into death, but from temporary life here on this earth to permanent life in heaven with God. Right? And so by giving David the land and by giving uh, David's army great strength and being able to defeat their enemies, God is making this a promise that he's made come to fruition. Okay? Uh, and it's going to grow strong. We know even under Solomon it's going to grow large. And we know probably maybe from stories that you've had in the past. David's lifetime was a life of war. Solomon's life was a time of peace. And that's the beauty of the Lord working here. Fulfilling that promise. Giving them the land. Now, David... When he fought his enemies, he was doing what the Lord wanted him to do. It wasn't like David was going out for pleasure. Like I might go out hunting for pleasure to hunt an animal. Maybe I want to shoot a deer or a turkey. I want to catch a fish. I do it for my pleasure, my enjoyment. I don't probably need to do those things. None of us need those things to survive. But David wasn't going out and fighting battles here because it pleased him. He was going out and fighting battles with these armies, knowing that some of his men probably would die because... It was God's command to him. God wanted David to go out and to fight. So he fights against the Philistines, we see, uh, and he's able to conquer them. And then, now if you remember, uh, David uh, had a wife who was a Moabitess, or I'm sorry, not David's wife, but David's grandma would be a Moabitess, and Ruth. And so he had sent his family to Moab for a time, and they had helped protect him. But here we see David has to go and fight Moab. Although they had been friendly for a time to David, they're probably now unfriendly. Maybe they had a new ruler come into place, or a new army leader, or their uh, makeup had, of the country had changed. Now they are no longer friendly to David and, uh, and the people of Israel and Judah. Um, so he has to go fight them. And then after his victory, we read them. He said that he made them lay down in a line. Lay down in these lines. And it was just kind of a random thing. That's all he was doing here. He's just randomly ordering the people in these three different lines, lie down on the ground. And he goes and he says, this line, kill them all. This line, kill them all. This line, save them. They're going to be our servants and our, some of our slaves. And so that's what David did. Okay? He made them, some of them his servants and brought them back. Now, why might he do that? Well, God, God ordained it. Obviously it was part of God's plan, but... Those servants would be workers. They would eventually probably be men that would go and help maybe cut down the trees or they would be sent to the quarries to help draw the rock out that would be used for in the future in the temple. Okay? 
So these servants are going to serve in that way. They're going to serve David and the people of the land. Now, uh, skip over chapter 9 and go to 2 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to read a little bit there about a specific battle. That's some victories that David had there. But we're going to take a look at uh, now some specific battles. Ammon, and then another battle will be with Syria. So chapter 10, verse 1. And then we'll read a little bit here. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun his son raised in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, and that he has sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. So Nahash King of Ammon, he died. He must have been friendly with David. They must have worked together or traded uh, maybe uh, encouragement with one another. Maybe they both had struggles and ideas and they traded those things with one another. Okay? And so David uh, sent some servants, some messengers to Hanun okay, to express condolences. We're sorry about the death of your father because he would be the new king. Our country does that. Let's say the Prime Minister of Canada died in an accident today. President Obama might not attend the funeral service directly, but he would probably send either Vice President Biden or he would send Secretary of State Kerry to go to Canada to be at the funeral service to express condolences to the Prime Minister's family, but also to all of the nation of Canada. And then... And expressing that to him, he's a representative of the United States. That's what David is doing here. He's sending his servants to go express to the son of Nahash, Hanun, saying, Hey, how about our king expresses his condolences, if there's anything that you need, if there's any wisdom, if there's any guidance, let us know. We'll share with you, we'll help you. But probably some of the wise <coughs> men who had helped, uh, who had helped uh, King Nahash were probably gone. They'd probably been dismissed by Hanan, too, too old, they weren't very wise or anything like that. So instead, probably had some new rulers who aren't as wise, and they say to the king of Ammon, these men are spies. They're not come here to give condolences from King David. These men are here as spies. So, maybe your first inclination as well as spies, they'll probably be killed. But that's not what the king does. No, he shames them in a different way. He takes their beards and he cuts half of them off. He takes their clothing and cuts portions of it off so that they return back to their land naked and ashamed. You see, the men of Israel wore their beards proudly. They were usually long and full beards. And for one to shave his beard is a sign of shame. Okay? It's the same thing that we see around us maybe with the Amish. They have a beard. Why? It's usually something that the men grow in their community after they're married. Okay? It's a symbol. It's a sign. And for a man to be 50 years old and married and five children and all of a sudden one day to be an Amish man and cut his beard off would not go over well in his community. It's a sign of shame. Okay? And so these men were afraid to show their faces back in his They couldn't even go before their brothers or their fathers or their wives or anyone else. They were ashamed for their nakedness, but also because their beards had been cut off. And that is exactly what the King, Ammon wa King Am of Ammon uh, wanted. Okay? So, what was the result? Well, it's probably because Ammon wants war. This will fire up those people of Judah. We have a stronger, better army. We'll fight the people of Israel and Judah. We'll defeat them and we'll get their land. That's probably what they're looking at. So, verse 6 here. Let's follow off long. 
And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Bath Rehob, and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and King Maacah, 1,000 men, and Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering end of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and Rehob and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him, against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother. He might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people, and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth good. And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, then fled they also before Abishai, and entered into a city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. Okay. So, again, uh, the Ammonites are probably jealous of Israel, or they want what they have, and so they come here to fight. That's the purpose. Okay. They send men in chariots, men on horseback, men on uh, foot soldiers. But they do what was common in those days. They hired them. These soldiers were hired men out of Syria. These men were men who were bloodthirsty. They loved nothing more than a good battle. They didn't really care probably to be farmers. They didn't care to be shepherds. No, these men were men who were bloodthirsty. They loved war. So they were willing to put themselves in harm's danger because that's what they were doing every time they were going out to battle. They were putting themselves in harm's way. They are those kind of people that think they're invincible. They can never die. Nothing bad will ever happen to them. So what do they do? They sign up. And they say, well, for this amount of money, I'll go to battle for you. I'll fight against the enemy. I've got no problem doing that. And that's what they go out and do. Okay? And so they go out to the battle and they fight. Okay? And, well, David sends out Joab to fight him. When the two battles come together to fight, Joab is wise. He splits his army up. He sends some men with Abishai to fight the Ammonites. And he took the best soldiers and his men to fight the Syrians. Because of these hired men, they were probably good fighters. So they split up. And they said, if you need help, call for us. If we need help, call for you. Okay? And there really wasn't much of a battle. The Lord was working here. However the Lord worked, the Syrians fled. They were afraid. And when the Ammonites saw the better soldiers, the Syrians fleeing, well, then they fled themselves too. Joab went back to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, although the Syrians uh, had fled, it went off somewhere back to their own nation. That's not the end of it. They're looking forward to doing battle here. They're looking forward to fighting. Yeah, not do that, Sydney. Don't do that either. Please follow along. So, verse 15. Let's start there to the end of this chapter. We'll see how they fought the Syrians. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together and had a reaser sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river. And they came to Helam. And Shobak, the captain of the host of Hadarezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shobak, the captain of their host, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants to Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon any more. So the Syrians had fled back their home, but they still didn't want to lose this battle. That was saying they were weak, and it might make the other nations around them think, ooh, the Syrians are weak, let's go attack them. So they wanted to try to get back here at Judah and Israel. So they gathered back together, they, they kind of regroup, maybe they get some more soldiers, they bring out their captains and their leaders. Okay? And now obviously whenever an a army was gathering together to do battle, somebody would see them doing that. And they would send a message back to King David. And so someone must have seen that. And someone did that here. They sent a message back to King David. David found out that the Syrians were preparing for battle up in the north. And so 
David and his men gathered an army, and they headed north. They came to this uh, place where the Syrians were gathering together in battle. An army, or a war broke out. The armies of the Syrians were soundly defeated. Okay? Uh, was a great number. Now what's interesting here is that word there, hold, is the way we might say it, but it actually means hot. Okay? Uh, and we find that, and we read it here, the idea there, did anybody look that up? What does hot mean? So you know it's spelled H-O-U-G-H-E-D. Kenton? Mm, no, not in this instance. They won't be clearing the throat. They won't be, uh, that wouldn't be a way in a battle to defeat the enemy, to clear your throat, unfortunately. Amber? To, like, cut the back of the leg off. All right. Not necessarily off, but in the back of our leg, okay, back here we have our Achilles tendon. Usually it's a pretty large muscle. And there is a large tendon that starts about up here and goes all the way down into your heel. It's not very stretchy. It's a very stiff, firm piece of muscle. Okay, it's really a tendon. Okay? And it is extremely strong. It can withstand great amounts of pressure. But every once in a while, a human being, maybe playing a sport or trying to do something at work, can tear or actually don't tear it because it's very hard to tear that, but what they call rupture. Usually it rips the end of that muscle right off the heel and it causes your heel to roll up like a projector screen or a, if you have a window shade at home, you pull it down and when it gets to the top, it goes over. That's what happens. Extremely painful. And on top of that, it's not something that can be easily fixed. Okay? A lot of nice things are, I break a bone, you know, a couple of months, I'm back at it. An injury like that to be fixed is usually a year, sometimes two years until you're fully recovered, or you'll just never have that strength back again. Well, if you want to defeat the horsemen, okay, all you have to do is take your sword, and the horsemen are up there up high. It's hard to get them up there, and you can, you can try to stab into the side of the horse, and the, you might accurately hit the horse's heart or its lungs, but it's still going to be able to move around and kick you and hurt you for a while. But do you want to disable the horse instantly? You hock it. You take your sword, and as that tall beast is going past, you aim for the legs. And the lower parts of the legs where the tendons are, you slice them right there, and instantly that horse is going to fall over. Hopefully, its rider will be crushed by the fall, or severely injured, and you can easily defeat him. But that horse won't be able to take another step if you successfully cut his tendon. Okay? He's going to be lame. He's going to be on three legs. And if you can get two of them, He's done. He's going to lay down there. Okay, typically today, if that happens to a horse, they usually have to put the horse down because it just isn't going to live. It's going to be miserable. It's not, it's not going to be able to do anything. And that's what they did here. So they hocked these horses as one way to try and defeat them in a battle. The Syrians are losing. They know, they're, they, they know they're going to be destroyed, so they make peace with Israel. And again, they agree to become servants, kind of like slaves. They bring gifts to David. Gifts of gold and brass and everything else. And what does David do with them? He doesn't put them in his own treasury. But instead he's established now a treasury for the future temple that will be built. He takes all this gold and riches and he puts it there. Okay? Alright, and then to the end, there's a few other wars. If we go back to chapter 8, turn back there. Second Samuel chapter 8, we read the first few verses. Uh, now we're going to start at verse 9. Just a few verses here. Starting at verse 9 of chapter 8. When Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the host of Hadarezer, then Toy sent Joram his son unto king David to salute him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and smitten him, for Hadadezer had wars with Toy. And Joram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass, which also king David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated of all the nations he had subdued. So we have a few other battles here that David fights. Toy, king of Hamath, uh, he fought with him. David won a victory over Toy and also his enemy Hadarezer. And trying to make peace with David, they sent some gold and silver. And again, David used those. He stored those up uh, to be stored up for the future tabernacle. Uh, the Edomites, uh, they were also causing trouble and uh, Abishai was sent to deal with them. 
And Abishai was able to defeat the uh, Edomites. So, why are these wars so important? Why do we study them? We don't really memorize the names of these kings, and we probably won't even remember or memorize the names of these uh, particular battles and places and all what happened. But what we're learning here is we're seeing how God is working on behalf of King David. They're important because it says in the Bible quite frequently, the Lord helped David wherever he went. The Lord helped his people to conquer these nations. The Lord helped them to have peace in their land. Okay? So it's the Lord doing the fighting here. So what does that teach us? Well, if the Lord is willing to help us, then it ought to be that we go to him frequently in prayer. Go to God in prayer. And ask for the Lord to help us, and to guide us, and to instruct us. Okay? And that way we find true blessings. Okay? When the Lord helps us, we go to Him, when we, or when we need Him, we go to Him in prayer. Okay? The Lord is helping David here. God loves us just as much. and He cares for us too. He's, he's, given the, he's given His only begotten Son to die for us. Why wouldn't He help us? Okay? And so in that way, we see the different blessings, the good things that uh, God does for David. He's also going to do for us, and he's going to help us.